Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. Three of 11 projects selected as preferred bidders under Emergency Procurement Program launched in 2020 have moved a step closer to construction. Terence Screamer joins me to discuss this and other procurement developments. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. Which projects are advancing and why have so few been able to progress under the Risk Mitigation Program? Well, there's the three Skytech projects that have been announced. Um, they are uh, 150 megawatts of dispatchable power between 5 in the morning and 9.30 at night. And quite interestingly, it's a combination of solar and batteries. So when the risk mitigation round was launched as a technology agnostic round, there was a view that this is a really a gas-only round. And we know that there were the car power ship bids and there were a number of wind, solar, gas projects that have bid. But only the, so far, the PV and the battery storage project uh, has, has got to the point of signing the agreements, the power purchase agreement, the direct agreement and the implementation agreement. And now they have 60 days to get to financial close. And once they do that, then the shovels will go in the ground and they'll start building really a large complex. Uh, it's across three sites uh, in the Northern Cape. And these three sites will have uh, over 540 megawatts of solar PV panels, a massive amount of PV, and a battery with 1.1 gigawatt hours worth of storage. And the, the you know, the, the, I think this whole issue around why other projects haven't got through is that it's been a very complex round. It was really not really fit for purpose. Um, even these projects are going to come in very, very expensive, around 1 rand 88 cents a kilowatt hour, although. Uh, the tariff is quite uh, difficult to understand because it involves uh, different dispatch rates, etc. So it's a, it's a, it's a complex. It happened at a time when prices were changing under uh, the developer's feet. Uh, prices of everything, panels, um, of batteries, of everything has gone up. And that has intensified um, recently with the uh, Ukraine-Russia conflict. So there are a lot of moving parts. but. Uh, there was warning right up the front that this was not really a fit for purpose type of procurement and there was a decision just to press ahead plus the car power ship projects faced major legal and environmental hurdles which still haven't been cleared so there were just so many different elements that were making these projects hard to close so it was quite uh, in some ways remarkable that three eventually have closed and the view is shouldn't we just move on and uh, the the argument is still from the IPP office and from the minister that they want to try and secure this electricity despite this high cost, despite the warnings of its poor design. Even these projects that are going to go ahead are going to have electricity that's going to be curtailed, that won't go into the grid, that if it could be injected into the network would actually lower the overall tariff. But it's just the way the design is. The design is for dispatchable electricity from five in the morning to 9.30 at night and there was no flexibility, there was no redesign of the program. So that, that is what we have procured and that's what the bidders had to meet. Those are the requirements that had to meet. And it obviously has become very difficult for most of the projects to meet those requirements. And I think at some point a decision is going to have to be made about whether we should pursue the other eight or whether we need to move on. What are the prospects for all the other procurement programs that are underway? Well, we know that the renewables around is also facing delays. So uh, as with this risk mitigation round, it was, <laughs> it was designed as an emergency procurement round for 2,000 uh, megawatts that uh, the RP identified as South Africa being short immediately. I mean, it's just taken forever in terms of first getting the RFP out and then move, moving to preferred bidders at the beginning of 2021. It's now we're midway through 2022 and we're only just getting these first three projects. So we can see there's a real problem with the way we're operating procurement. Now the renewables round that we know was stopped or disrupted since 2014 when Eskom refused to sign any new PPAs. Eskom under previous leadership, who without evidence suggested that we had enough electricity in the system. We know now that we definitely did not and we need to uh, get procurement going again. Now, restarting procurement has been tricky. It's also come at a time when supply chain disruptions, issues of costs, rising costs have come into the system. And these bids were made just ahead of all these, some of these uh, changes in the environment. 
plus there, were, there are very high local content thresholds that have been put in for PV panels. So that has affected the even the renewables round, which we were in a we were in a certain slow, but we were in a rhythm prior to 2014, which was totally smashed and disrupted by the ESCOM at, at the time. And now we're having to restart, and we're restarting with all sorts of uh, difficulties in the environment. And the bids were made at fairly aggressive rates. So now, instead of closing uh, in April, as, as was supposed to happen, we now have the staggered uh, completion to bid window five over the July and September. We'll have to wait and see whether the bidders are able to meet their commitments that they made at preferred bidder stage. So there's that. So there is progress, and it seems to be happening. And then there's bid window six out in the market. So uh, that also that deadline is looming, and they have changed some of the parameters. And there will be a bidders conference soon to unpack the changes to that. Uh, and then there's, there's suggestions that the gas to power uh, procurement will start soon. So there is movement, but because of the disruption, we are in no sort of rhythm. And because of the changes in the environment, it's, it's getting very difficult for projects to, to cross that line. Efforts are being made to streamline processes for utility and embedded generation projects. Yes, now, you know, the utility scale centralised procurement through the RPP office used to be the only game in town, but we know now that uh, with the change, uh, the reform allowing projects below 100 megawatts to enter without a licence, there's a lot of activity happening there. It took, again, a long time to get the first registration through the system. We have that now. And it looks like there's a, a series of registrations that are now going to follow uh, through the NERSA process. So we're going to start seeing a lot more action there. And I think Operation Vulundlela should be congratulated on the work they've done to try and unblock uh, the, not only get the legislation through, but to get the actual mechanisms through uh, to allow these projects to actually get their registration so that uh, projects can now start moving. And I, I, it looks like there's going to be another 16 coming through in the next week or so. So that's quite promising. But on the centralised procurement, the IPP office procurement, which is very important and needs to be at a consistent rhythm, we can see the, the risk mitigation has been very delayed. We can see the delays with the renewables procurement. And the, apparently lessons are being drawn very much from the risk mitigation. I don't think we'll see another techno technology agnostic round, for instance, but also different processes internally to the IPP office, as well as in the government system. All these different regulations that you have to get through and permits that you require from uh, water use licenses to environmental authorizations, these things just need to be streamlined in terms of, and also the NERSA pr licensing process. And I think there is more of a coming together probably a bit of energy injected because of what's happened on the uh, 100 megawatt projects into this. And there is a streamlining, plus some of the lessons, for instance, there's this, these SCATEC projects are the first to have signed anti-bribery clauses, which uh, was now going to be integrated into all the future projects. That's very important to keep this as, as corruption-free as possible. Uh, uh, so th there's, there's some lessons, and we're hearing that uh, streamlining of processes is starting to happen both inside the IPP offices and within this broader government ecosystem that is required to work uh, to get these projects over the line. And we know how desperate we are for new electricity. So it's very important that those processes get uh, streamlined. Minister Montasha has also spoken about updating the overall plan that guides procurement. Yes, now we know that the integrated resource plan of 2019 is widely recognised as being out of date. Um, and it was even out of date by the time it was published because it took so long uh, to get from a draft phase into an actual gazette phase. And we also know it took very long to get to our RP 2019, which was a, a material update to the, the 2010 version and an important update. But, it's, but it really has assumptions in it that are totally incorrect. It has constraints in it that are totally uh, ridiculous in the current context. So it's got assumptions around Eskom's energy availability factor from its coal plant, which are not going or not being realised and are never going to be realised. We're running at about a 55% uh, EAF at the moment, and the, the plan is modelled at 75% plus EAF. So suddenly the gap of what you need just by dealing with that issue 
is far larger than the 2,000 megawatts that was suggested in the initial plan. So it needs to be updated. And also, there's also gaps. Um, uh, one, because they don't, there's a limit on how much wind and solar can be procured every year. There's also gaps every, in the yearly allocations for solar, for instance. So Bid Window 7, for instance, is supposed to have no solar, only wind, which would be crazy in the current context. The price assumptions that are, that are baked into it are wrong and need to be updated. So there's a, it's, it's a very important step that Gwede Mantash has said that there's now uh, there's a decision by Cabinet that this should be updated. This was made at a Cabinet retreat over the last few days uh, where the President asked every Minister what is the burning platform in their area of work and Mantash said load shedding was his burning platform, which is correct. And it's very important that he's owning that because at one point he would say load shedding is a DPE issue, not so much a, a, a Department of Energy issue. You know. DPE must sort out Eskom and then we will have no load shedding. But I think there's a realisation now the EAF is not going to recover. And if the EAF is not going to recover, we need to get as much uh, a new private electricity into the system, whether it's private, whether it's municipal, whether it's publicly owned, uh, whether it's even Eskom. We need uh, a project, although they're very financially constrained. We need to get this electricity into the system. And the, the overarching plan is important for that. It needs to give us proper visibility based on firmer assumptions or up-to-date assumptions. And there should be a regular updating of those uh, assumptions. And once we get into a rhythm there again of updating every year, and then we just, you know, you, it, will, it will smooth the process, it will improve investment uh, certainty, it will raise confidence overall. Because at the moment, uh, with a plan that's out of date and with system, uh, with a, s a procurement system that is still struggling to get its engine started and, and really moving, uh, there's a, a, it's a real problem for South Africa because we can see that load shedding is going to get much, much worse if we don't get this new uh, capacity onto the system. So it's an important signal from the Minister and I, I think one that should be welcomed at last. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also. Don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News Daily email newsletter.